bring up two things, then we'll have a short prayer, and then we'll get into the lesson. Um, number one, <laughs> number one, many years ago, Elsa Thomas was here worshiping with us, and every once in a while, he would ask us to sign a card for a lady named Cheryl Lamar, who was incarcerated in the Chow Chillin Women's Prison. She'd been there for many, many years. And uh, she was a baptized believer, and she uh, started Bible studies with the women down there in the prison. And she had quite a number of Bible studies, and I believe that she led, uh, if Edsel might remember what Edsel told me, that uh, she led many of the inmates there to the Lord. And they were baptized into Christ there in the prison. And then when they got out, they went out, you know, to a congregation somewhere, I'm sure. But... We prayed and prayed for Cheryl. We sent her birthday cards. If you remember, we signed them. Well, as it is, Cheryl Lamar has been released. And she's now living in Vallejo, I believe with her son. And she called me this week, and I can't tell you how much joy I had talking to her on the phone. She was so grateful that we had supported her and prayed for her sent her those cards. She said it kept her going and encouraged her. And right now, and I told her, I'd sure like to meet you in person. Why don't you come and visit with us? And she said, well, right now during COVID, I'm not coming. <laughs> but as soon as COVID lifts, she's coming to visit us. And I said, that's going to be a great day where we can finally meet her face to face. So I told her she needs to watch the video today on YouTube and she can hear me tell the whole congregation how grateful she is. So let's keep praying for Cheryl Lamar. I'm really excited about that. Also, uh, Damon came and told me, and Maggie texted me earlier, we had a, her nephew, Maggie's nephew, Jerry Clark, uh, preach here uh, about a year and a half ago. Some of you remember him. He had a, a stroke, and he's in the hospital right now. And so let's have a short prayer for Jerry, and then we'll begin our message. Our Father in heaven, we ask a special prayer at this time for our brother in Christ, Jerry Clark, faithful gospel preacher and, and teacher and helper here in the valley with so many congregations. We pray, Father, that you will come for him, be with the doctors and nurses that are working with him, that he might regain his health, health if it be your will, and that he might continue on with the work of the Lord that he's been doing all these years. Thank you, Father, for such a faithful brother in Christ, and we pray for him. Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, our lesson this morning is called Planting and Watering. Our scripture reading this morning is an exciting passage. Now, in this passage, which starts in chapter 1 and goes to chapter 4 and verse 21, Paul is talking about sectarianism in the church of Corinth. Man, sectarianism, that's a big word. <laughs> Sectarianism means they were dividing into groups, and they were there was division in the church. He talks about it in chapter 1, verse 10. We're going to talk a little bit more about this at the end of the lesson. But in verse 9 is what I get excited about. Verse 9 says that we are fellow workers with God. Can you imagine that? Little old Jim Holland on planet Earth, little speck, is a fellow worker with the God of this world, and so are you. That's what I get excited about. What a privilege it is for us to work with the Almighty God in this effort of evangelism, saving souls. At the same time, what an awesome responsibility we have as workers, co-workers with Him. God expects us to bear fruit. He expects us to be involved in the process. And that's what this lesson is about, planting and watering. In John chapter 15, verses 1 through 8, John says, or Jesus says, written in the book of John, I am the true vine, Jesus says. My Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear.
bear more fruit. He says, you are already clean, speaking with his apostles in the upper room, because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. So the question now is, what role will I have in this fruit bearing? What is my role in fruit bearing? And there are three roles in this process. First is planting, Paul says, 1 Corinthians 3, verse 6. First is planting. And then there is watering, and then giving the increase. Verse 6 tells us that God's part in this, God's role, is to give the increase. And that can and does take a lot of pressure off of us. At least I think so. It takes a lot of pressure off me. I don't have to give the increase. All I need to do is plant and water. And that leaves those two roles, planting. And planting is planting the seed, the Word of God, and then watering. So in this morning's lesson, I want to talk about three things. Number one, how do we plant the seed? That's terrifying to most Christians. <laughs> but I'm trying to relieve that, that fear in our congregation about planting the seed and showing what that's all about. And then, what does it mean to water? And then other details that matter. Other details that matter a lot. Uh, things that we don't often think about, but are very important. So, this morning, how do we plant the seed? First off, we talk to people. That's all we have to do, is talk to people. Start a conversation, or at, as we are conversing with people, as all of us do, make room in the conversation to bring up the spiritual. A simple question. What church do you go to? Or, um, what uh, do you go to church? Or do you like to study the Bible? Or, Listen carefully to what they say. I like that one myself. Listen carefully to what they say. Many people bring up spiritual matters all the time. If you just stop, start talking to people, they will open the door to the spiritual. We don't have to venture out in most cases and say, you know, do you go to church? Or what church do you go to? There's nothing wrong with that. But if we're fearful of doing that, just let them talk. Because most people will eventually bring up the spiritual. They'll talk about prayer. I've been praying about it. Oh, you pray? You, you're a religious person? Or they might uh, talk about their church. Oh, where do you go to church? And there's a conversation right there. They might say something about the Bible. Or they might talk about troubles in their life. They're having trouble. And that opens the door for us to tell them about Jesus and how he can take away those troubles. Be ready to interject something into that conversation. That's what we need to do. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15, we need to be ready to interject something into that conversation. I know the scripture doesn't say that, but we need to be ready to give an answer. We need to be ready to jump into that conversation. Sometimes it's a good idea just to let people keep talking for a while. Let them talk. It's amazing how wide the door of opportunity opens when we let them talk. And they'll open the door. All we have to do is walk through it. 
appreciate Tom's prayer this morning for the lost. You know, this year, we need to pray that a lot. Just one in 2021. We need to pray about the loss. I love Tom's prayer. Thank you, Tom. We don't have to dominate the conversation. We just have to be ready to get in the conversation and not be afraid of it. And don't be afraid to admit, I don't know it. If you don't know the answer to a question that comes up. I talked to a brother just after last week's sermon. And he mentioned this very thing. A lot of, there's a lot of religious people out there that we get into the conversations. And they, they, they start bringing up things. And we don't know the answer. They may ask us a question. Well, don't let that scare you. We could probably ask them a lot of questions that they don't have the answer to. So if you get in that conversation and... And you, uh, you don't know the answer. Just say, you know, I don't know. But I'll, I'll look it up. I'll try to find that answer for you. Do you know the answer? See, and let that conversation keep going. There is no shame in not knowing everything. You know, as Jesus said, for, uh, he who is without sin cast the first stone. You know, I could easily say, he who knows all the answer, please stand up. Nobody's going to stand up because we don't have all the answers. So don't be ashamed to say, you know, I don't know, but I'll find out. And if you don't know the answer, go search out the answer. That's the way we learn. That way, next time if that question comes up, we'll be ready to answer that. I will give you this caution, because I learned the lesson the hard way. Don't try to fake your way through it. <laughs> if you don't know the answer, say you don't know the answer. And move on. When I first started preaching here back in 1990, there was a young man who came to clean our carpets in the building. I was sitting in my office. He said, you mind if I eat lunch in your office? I said, no, that's great. And I thought, oh boy, here we go. I can talk to him about the Lord. And we started talking about the Lord. And then uh, as the conversation winded down, he said, uh, you know, do you study with people? I said, yeah, I do. And I thought, man, this is too easy. <laughs> He's coming here. And so we set up a time, and I went to study with him. And, you know, here I am, a young preacher, knowing all the answers right out of preaching school. I'm ready to go. I go over to this guy's house at night, a young man, probably in his mid-twenties. And I'm um, sitting there on the couch. He said, just be a minute. Let me get my Bible. And then I noticed all these other guys running around, like four or five other guys. And they were rushing around. They were all grabbing their Bibles. And one by one, they came in to sit in the living room. And I thought, oh, man, this is going to be great. And then uh, I start talking to them, and they start asking me questions, and uh, and they stumped me on an answer, and I I tried to fake my way through it, and I knew I had been had. Have you ever had that feeling? Where you know, oh man, they've got me, they've got me here, they got me back in. I don't know the answer, and I felt I had to come up with the answer, and I moved on. I asked them a question, we changed the subject, and we moved on. But I, I remember to this day like it was yesterday, walking out to my car thinking, I am never going to do that again. Never, ever. And I have. I live by that. If someone asks me a question, I'll do my best to answer it. But if I don't know the answer, I will tell them, I don't know the answer to that. Let me find out. And then you follow up with them later on. So, don't try to fake it, but don't be afraid either, because it's a conversation, and we're doing what the Lord asks us to do. Remember, our job is not to increase, our job is to sow the seed. We all have some of the seed that we can sow. So, keep the conversation going, follow up with them, and keep in mind what Paul says, and this is very important. My mentor taught me this early, early on. 2 Peter, I mean, 2 Timothy 2, 24 through 26. And the servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, in humility, correcting those who are in opposition, that God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth. Keep that verse in mind. 
Because that's going to make all the difference in the world when you're patient, you're humble with them and gentle. The second thing, first thing is talk to people. The second thing is use the tools at your disposal. We have an arsenal of information at our disposal. Great information. All we have to do is take the time to use it. Not just to hand it out, but to read and listen to these things ourselves. Increasing our knowledge and preparing ourselves for the task at hand, and that is planting and watering. Preparing ourselves for that question when it comes up. I know the answer to that because I read about it. I studied that. So, what is this arsenal I'm speaking of? Number one is prayer. Remember the first step in evangelizing people? Prayer. Unleashing the power of God to work in other people's lives. We're going to sow the seed. And the power is in the Word of God. Romans chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. That's where the power is. We're just the seed throwers. <laughs> okay? And we do that by asking the Lord's help. First thing we do is pray. Thank you, Tom, for praying for that this morning. We also have in our arsenal DVDs. If you look out there when you go out and when you come in for here, we have DVD racks now with great DVDs on them. And we have a lot more. One family in our congregation has provided these for us. Many, many DVDs. So we have these DVDs. And if they just sit there, they're no use at all. But if we take them and pop them in our DVD players, we're going to gain a wealth of knowledge. And we're going to arm ourselves and be ready for those questions when they come our way. We also have Bible tracts. And we have Gospel Minutes. They're right out there. We walk by them every time we come in and go out. They're all right there. A wealth of information on all kinds of subjects. We can read about them, watch them, and then pass them on to someone else. These are our tools that God has provided us with. And also, there is the preacher. You can ask the preacher for help. And you can ask the elders too. We're here. We're here to help. We're here to work with you. We're all God's workers trying to accomplish the same thing. We can ask fellow members for help. We can encourage one another. We can, we can go with others to their Bible studies. Or if they want us to meet somebody, and maybe they say, I want them to meet somebody else in the church. Guess what we're doing? We're watering. We're planting the seed. We're working together. These things matter. Number three, we have invitation cards. Now, I ordered these this week, okay? So they're not here yet. They'll be here Wednesday. But we, I ordered some invitation cards. I always like to hand out something to someone when I invite them, uh, whether it's my business card or whatever it is. And here's the card that I ordered. It's square. It's two and a half by two and a half square. It says, I'm inviting you to be my guest. And then the event is left blank. We can fill that in. Worship, Bible study, youth group, youth devo, whatever it may be. We can write it in there. The date, we can put the date, we can put the time, and then there's the place. Now, for those who have outside the building activities that we want to invite our friends to, we can cross that out, and then down at the bottom, see notes on the back. And then the back side is blank. So you can write on it and leave all the notes you want. And that, that takes some of the pressure off you. Here, I want to invite you. And then guess what they do? Oh, you go to this church? Oh, yeah, yeah. Why don't you come and worship with us? We have a great Bible study on Revelation going. Why don't you come? Or we have great ladies' Bible classes on Tuesday, every other Tuesday. Whatever it may be, these are very easy to use. And getting a card like this, it's a multi-use card. I ordered 5,000 of these. No, I didn't. I ordered 500 of these. And we can order more. But the idea is we can use these from now till the Lord comes again. Okay? And we'll order more if we need, need them. But 
I do want to make this one point about inviting people to Bible class or to worship or Devo or whatever. If you invite someone to worship or study with us, be there. Because there's nothing worse than you inviting someone and then you not showing up. And they stand around like a deer in the headlights with no friend around. Now the rest of us go up to them, but it's not the same. So if you invite someone, be there. So when they come there, they will have a friendly face and then you can take over from there. And then the fourth thing is be excited. Be upbeat. If we aren't excited about it, why would somebody else be excited about it? Uh, why, don't you, why don't you come to church with me? Oh, man. If your church is as dead as you are, you know, I'll go somewhere else. You know, let's be excited about it. Why don't you come to worship with us? Why don't you come to study with us? We have a great class or whatever. But be excited. We serve a wonderful, gracious, merciful, powerful God who floods us and overwhelms us with blessings. And this is something to get excited about, excited about and be joyful about. Amen. We want to share this with others. We have the greatest thing in the world here. That's the Lord and His Word Amen. and His church. We should be excited about it and not, not afraid to invite others. And then, number five is live a life that reflects Christ. Yes. When we invite others, when we talk to others, we have to back that up. Matthew 5, 16, Jesus said, Let your light so shine before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. If we don't back up our message with a life that reflects that message, it's just talk. It's just a lot of noise. It's empty words. However, when they see the Word of God at work in our lives, it will get their attention. And they'll listen. They'll listen. So, that's how we plant the seed, those five things. Be aware of that. So secondly now, what does it mean to water and how do we do it? Let me remind you what verse 8 says. Paul says by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Now he who plants and he who waters are one. They're one and the same. The one who plants and the one who waters are one. And there are two ways of looking at this. Number one, we all serve both roles. We all fill both roles, planters and waterers. And then the other way, and you can go either or or both, we all act as one in this effort. We're all working on this as one. Now that fits in with 1 Corinthians 12, 12 and 13. For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body. The fact is, some people are great at planting and others are better at watering. We all work together as one body to get the job done. And then the text tells us in 1 Corinthians 3, the second part of verse 8, and each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. I was talking to another brother in Christ this week here at the church building. And we were talking about this and, and uh, you know, what it means to work together. I, said, well, I can't study with somebody. He said, then bring them to me. We'll work as a team. You bring them, I'll study with them. Things like that. And he said, and it doesn't sound real good what he said, you know, it sounds a little off. But, and I get credit for it? <laughs> and I said, yes, you get credit for it. Because that's what this verse right here says when you think about it. Each one will receive his reward, his own reward, according to his own labor. In other words, you get credit for it. In the eyes of God. Isn't that great? Right. So we get credit for it. We work together. So, how do I water? When someone brings a friend with them, go out of your way to be kind to them. 
Introduce yourself. Tell them how glad you are to meet them and how glad you are that they're here. And this will take a little bit, a very little bit, of time and effort on our part. It doesn't take very long to be friendly and kind to someone. But be sure, and this is important, be sure to be genuine and sincere. Be genuine and sincere. We truly do care about lost souls. We truly do. This is not some act to fill the pews. It's not some act to put on to, to get more money in the church. That's not what it's about at all. It's about saving their soul. So, then, so that they can receive the blessings in Christ. If you see a person outside the building, maybe at a restaurant or a market or somewhere, and you recognize them as a visitor, say hello to them. Be friendly. The worst thing we can do is ignoring them. Introduce your friend to others at the assembly. Studies have shown that if a person gets to know at least four people in that congregation, they will most likely uh, come back and even stay in that congregation. If they, the more people they meet. Try to remember the names of the people who come to visit. If you remember their names, they're going to be blown away. It's a challenge for a lot of us. It's a challenge for us to remember names, isn't it? But try your hardest to remember those names. If they return and visit again, acknowledge them. Go over and say hello. And again, if you remember their names, they're going to think you're the greatest thing since sliced bread. You remembered my name? And the reason we remember their name is because we're sincerely interested in them. We're not putting on a play. We're not putting on an act. Make a point to be friendly. Some people are shy. But you can say hello. You can introduce yourself. Just say hello. Shake their hand. Or whatever we do now to say hello to people. <laughs> the worst thing we can do, again, is to ignore them. If you bring someone with you to the worship service, stick around and let people greet them. Don't rush out of the church building like the building's on fire. Okay? The worst thing we can do, well, one of the things we can do is just rush our people right out the door, our friends. Bring them around. Show them how friendly we are, genuinely. For those who are in Christ, for those who are new to Christ, new Christians, it is important for us to keep watering them. Help the new Christian to grow to maturity in Christ. If you know that they're baptized and you see them coming along, Get to know them. Genuinely get to know them. Back when, the, if you can remember back, put on your thinking caps, try to remember when the restaurants were open. <laughs> we can take people out for lunch. We can still do something like that if they're comfortable. But when the restaurants are open, we're going to populate those restaurants again. That's a great way to do it. But get to know them. Spend some time with them. Keep talking to them and get to know them. Sincerely, sincerely. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 5 through 9, in the context. This passage is found in a greater context. Chapter 1, verse 10 to chapter 4, verse 21. Paul is addressing sectarianism in the church, Corinth, or division, or cliques, if you will. One of the criticisms people have of churches, not necessarily this church, but churches in general, and I've heard it before, is there's too many cliques in the churches. There's too many separate groups. And I don't know where I fit in. I feel like I don't fit in. And that's, that's a good observation because people really do feel that way. People are breaking into various groups in Corinth based on who led them or baptized them into Christ. And Paul's point in this passage, in context, is that we are all one in Christ. There is only one group. And that group is called the church. And those, that group of people is in Christ. 
Others may have planted the seed and led them to Christ, but we are all charged with watering to help them grow and mature in Christ. And hopefully they too will be able to become planters of the seed and waterers also. We all are in this together. And I'm not talking about COVID. I'm talking about evangelists. We're all in this together as fellow laborers with God. We're planters and waters. God will give the increase. Amen. He will. He will. We've seen that in the past. And I don't want to go in the past because last week I preached I'm not looking at the past. <laughs> but he will give the increase. Do we believe that or not? You know, I'm going to preach on this sometime in the future. We better get ready for the increase. If we start planting and watering more, we better be ready for the increase. Because it's coming, folks. The Lord is going to bless people. And they're going to be coming here. We better get ready. We're going to need teachers. We're going to need song leaders. We're going to need people to do all kinds of things. We better be ready to work. If we're not ready to work, we don't believe them. Let's just stop right here. It feels a lot. No, that's not us. That's not the church. We're planters and waters and workers Amen. with God. So let's get ready to go. So lastly this morning, other details that matter. And here are the things that are really important that we don't often think about. Number one, the church grounds outside. The outside of the building. Years ago when I first started here, it was in the month of August, 1990. I started on August 1st. I started at Merced College on August 16th, I think. Because I hadn't been to college, so I wanted to start working at college. And I took a couple of classes. One of the classes I took was an anthropology class, I think. And I sat down next to this lady, and we got to talking. And we'd sit by each other each week and kept on talking and stuff. And I told her I was a minister. She said, oh, really, where? And I said, the Church of Christ on Yosemite Parkway. And she goes, hmm. You know, she goes, hmm. She goes, I know where that church is. I said, do you? And she goes, yeah. I thought that church had gone out of business. I thought they had closed the doors. And I said, no. Why would you think that? She said, because the outside, the grass is all dead. The plants are all grown up. And things like that. And I came back and told the elders and the deacons. From that very Sunday that I told them, we start focusing on the outside of the building. On the outside of the building. We've never given it up. It's important to us. You know what? Come to find out, she was a member of the church. She was out of duty. Her brother is very active at 20th and age. And if I said her name or his name, many of you know him. But it was his sister. She was out of duty. Later on, she moved out of the area, but she came back here for a while. She worshiped here for a while. Then she got married and moved away. I'm so proud of that. I'm so glad we had that conversation. Because sometimes we forget about how the outside of the building looks. So, we have several people in our congregation, many people, who help maintain the appearance of the building so it doesn't slip into a, uh, uh, disrepair and look like we're out of business. It's important. Okay? First impressions do matter. Many people draw a conclusion about us before they even step foot into our building. We need to realize that. We need to realize that. And how does the inside of the building look once they enter? Many people draw a conclusion about us before they even step into the building. But when they enter into the building, what do they see? We need to get used to looking at things through the eyes of visitors. What do they see? Hopefully they see in us a very good group of people. Loving and kind. Hopefully we project that to them. And I think they do. And I think we do. They see that. We've had multiple visitors tell us that. But what about the building itself? Is the building inside, is it dirty? Is it unkempt? 
Is it clean and welcoming? Are there lights burned out? Do we have a well-maintained track rack and DVD rack? You see, it's important. If you see something that stands out, something we can improve upon, tell someone about it and then help to make it better. Don't just tell someone, but be willing to help to make it better. People notice. They notice if it's in bad shape and it sends a message to them, an unspoken message. And they notice if it's in good shape, well maintained, it sends a message that we're serious about this. So in conclusion, there are so many things to consider when trying to reach the lost. We don't want them to be hindered by anything. We want them to have a clear path to the message of Jesus Christ and nothing, nothing takes their eyes off of that. So this morning, I hope you have considered what your role is in evangelizing just one in 2021. Each of us, every last one of us, has an important role to do. And it's not a play. It's not something we're faking our way through. We're genuine about it. We're sincere about it. We should all see our part as an integral part in bringing the lost to Jesus by either sowing the seed or watering the seed sown. And keep in mind what Paul said in verses 8 and 9. Now he who plants and he who waters are one. Each one will receive his own reward according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. We are God's building. Mm. If you're here this morning and you haven't been baptized into Christ, you've never obeyed the gospel, we hope that you will consider that to do that. It's a command by God that if we want to be saved, we have to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. First, we have to hear it. Once we hear it, we're going to make a, we're going to make a choice. We either believe it or we don't. I don't think you'd be here if you didn't believe it. If you're here and you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, he, that belief gives you the power to go on and repent of your sins and turn and follow after Him. Confess Jesus as the Son of God and be baptized into Christ, fully immersed in water, not sprinkled, not poured, <coughs> but dipped, immersed in water. Following the example or the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, we're buried with Christ in water, raised up a new creature to newness of life, completely forgiven of all our sins. We come in contact with the blood of Jesus that re remits our sins in the waters of baptism, ready to live faithful from that day forward to Jesus Christ, loyal to Him. If you haven't done that, we're ready. We're ready. The water is warm, I hope. The water is clean, I'm pretty sure. And I know we have clothes that you can put on. You can leave here dry. You don't have to go home wet in your car. You can leave here dry. But those are minor considerations for what you're going to do. And what you're going to do is dedicate your life to the Lord in obedience to the gospel. If you're here this morning and you need to respond and you'd like to be baptized, we're going to sing a song of invitation in just a moment. And you can respond, and we'll baptize you into Christ this morning after you take your confession. If you're here this morning, you are a baptized believer. You're a member of the body of Christ, but you haven't been faithful, you haven't been dedicated, you haven't been loyal. It's time to rededicate your life to the Lord. Come home to the Lord this morning. If you need the prayers of the church, we encourage you to come forward also for strength. If for any reason you need to respond this morning, won't you come right now while we stand and while we sing?